Justice Tech Pros here. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, not really much going on in the world. Everything's pretty normal. <laughs> Just kidding around with that. But uh, hope everybody's you know moving along. Anyway, uh, today I wanted to do a uh, an episode on a couple issues. One's in an immediate issue actually that uh, I was thinking about. As I spoke about in the past, they use uh, Pinkerton liability quite often uh, with uh, organized crime cases or cases where they're um, trying to tie uh, higher level uh, members of you know organizations to crimes that they know they have no knowledge or participation in. And it got me thinking with this unfortunate and tragic murder of um, George Floyd, which is just, uh, you know, ho horrible to watch somebody get killed like that is, you know, there's no, there's no way of twisting that or turning that. They just murdered the guy. And it's truly tragic and I feel terrible for the family to have to witness something like that. And I was thinking, although I know right now it's on a state level, but if it does wind up being uh, federal charges wind up being brought, I'm curious if they would use the Pinkerton liability, which they always try to use in other cases, whereas the higher ups will also be liable. You know, they use the terminology of reasonably foreseeable, which I've spoken about is a uh, crazy logic, you know, to determine somebody's reasonable uh foresight what they could pretty much predict by looking into a crystal ball so by that theory i'm wondering if if they would then charge the higher ups of that police department with the murder as well because that obviously by their standards could be reasonably foreseeable um so many you know minorities have been killed in the past by law enforcement so an argument could be made that it is legitimately foreseeable. But I wouldn't hold our, you know, your breath on that one because I doubt you'd see that surface. But it really makes you think why they pick and choose that. Uh, here's an opportunity where you could you know, charge uh, anybody um, linked to that department with liability of murder. If they throw that Pinkerton liability at, you know, towards that case and charge appropriately as they deem fit and how they have done so in the past on uh, on cases. And it makes you, you know, if they don't, I think that kind of really shows what that law is all about, you know, where that it is such a crazy law where they try to pull in people who have nothing to do with the crime but they simply want to try to charge them, so they add this Pinkerton liability where they could take somebody who supposedly holds a, a higher position within an organization, and they could then charge them with the same crime that another member of the organization has committed. So again, by that theory, that would mean that a lot of the members of that department who weren't even there, weren't even on site, could have charges of murder brought against them and, and stand trial for that if federal charges are wound up happening. And when you think about that concept and you put it like that, I'm sure there's people listening, oh, that's ridiculous, why would they do that? You know, they have nothing to do with that. And they should look at the other, flip side of that coin. Okay, I'll agree with you, I'll agree with that concept because I think it is crazy. I think it's insane to charge somebody who wasn't there, had no knowledge, had no participation, but you're going to group them together and just charge them based on being part of a larger organization. And, you know, maybe that, that way of putting it will enlighten some people as to how unfair that liability law is and, and how it is being misused in a lot of ways. And it's being, you know, they're picking and choosing when and when not to use it. And you would think it would be something across the board. And by them not using it across the board, I think it just really 
puts a spotlight on the mentality behind it when they're just trying to get a target who may be innocent of charges, have nothing to do with the charges, but if they make assumptions or they believe that this individual is a high-ranking member or part of an organization, they're going to lump him in to perhaps other individuals who have stronger evidence tying them to a crime. And when you think about it logically and you analyze it, it, it doesn't make sense at all. And I'm sure it would cause an uproar if they tried to do it in the situation I just uh, spoke about. And rightfully so, because it is, in my opinion, it's absurd, it's irrelevant, and it's just almost made up where you're, you're taking an innocent person and you're lumping, lumping them into a crime they have no knowledge about, no participation about, knew nothing about it, and now they're being charged with a serious offense. And, you know, I was just thinking about that, and there's so many instances where that could be utilized, and if you notice, it's never used. Uh, they'll try to use it here and there on organized crime cases or cases where they're trying to target an individual. And it's just a little food for thought because that concept, although it, it does sound, it, do, it does seem to go against common sense, it is used and it's done. And why would they pick and choose when it should be done? And that should cause one to think. And, you know, that's really what this show's all about. It's not about me trying to convince anybody. It's not about me trying to, um, uh, I don't want to say persuade, because I guess persuade uh, would be a positive thing. You know, if somebody is open-minded and they're a reasonable person and, they, they have an, and they're an intelligent person, they would be open to another side of things. I know myself personally, I'm always open to learn something new. I'm always open to look at the other side of things. I try to use uh, whatever knowledge base I have. I try to also use common sense. And I try to use the internal law of what's fair and textbook law of what's fair and what's just. And you try to utilize all those, th those things when you're making a determination. And if you start to analyze a situation and you see it doesn't fit the, the criteria of being just, of making sense, it could cause you to, to change your opinion, and there's nothing wrong on that, in that. But I, I have learned recently, especially when you read, you know, a lot of these um, online uh, blogs and these online groups, you have a lot of people who are just closed-minded. You know, they see things black and white. Uh, they don't, they don't leave themselves open to absorb additional material and to view a different side of it. You know, they're very adamant, and even if they're proven wrong, they'll revert to just this nonsensical belief of what they deem to be right. And if that's the path, you know, they wish to take, that's fine, they're entitled to it, but then they should not claim that they do have an open mind or they do uh, or they are going by the facts or they are going by what's being presented in front of them with proof and with backup and with documentation they should just accept the fact that they are closed minded uh they only have one way of of thinking and anything presented to them that is factual doesn't really hold any weight and they need to be a little accountable about that and self reflect and understand that's the type of person they are and I always say this show is not for those individuals. They might as well just not tune in, not listen, because that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to just open the mind of, of the general public and potential jurors to be free thinkers and just look at the situation in front of you and try to understand it on a more simplistic form and try to understand it in a way where it relates to what is just and what is not. And when you're serving on a jury and you're being presented with facts and you're being presented with evidence, you know, you have to really take the time to go through those things and almost carve out your personal beliefs because that's what your job is and that's what your responsibility is. You know, you can't convict somebody and you can't 
only weigh the facts that fit the narrative that you have in your head before the trial even starts. If you start off one way in your ideology and what you believe to be true and the facts lead you down a different path, you have the right to, you have the duty actually to then render a decision and render a verdict based on what was presented to you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people with that mindset where the ends justify the means, where they'll believe somebody was guilty in the past, they'll believe somebody is a certain type of person, is a, a member of a certain organization, and those type of people, it, it's irrelevant what story the facts tell. You know, the second they sit down, they just feel this person's guilty, and that's going to be the end of it. And I'm, I'm hoping this audience, you know, we're growing, I mean, which is phenomenal. We're at, uh, I believe, 3,700 subscribers, which is great. And I, and I really hope that the majority of those subscribers are open-minded. I would assume they are because to subscribe, that means you are interested in the content. And by now, I believe we're at 32 episodes. Those who have listened understand what I'm trying to accomplish here and the tone of this podcast and the theme of it. So I would believe that they keep tuning in time and time again to, to see the other side of things and to understand how things work from a first-person perspective as opposed to reading about it on the internet, reading about it in, uh, throughout the media, and reading about it in textbooks. It's very important that you see what plays out in real life and how it could affect you because it may not affect you directly. But as I've said in the past, you never know. It could uh, affect a friend, a family member, where they're entangled in the uh, justice system. And I believe any person would just want that individual to get a, the right to a fair trial and to have the facts presented be a reflection of the vote by the jurors. When the jury deliberates, you would hope that it's based on the facts and not based on anything else. And you would hope that beyond a reasonable doubt, is what is used as a guideline. And what's amazing with the Pinkerton liability, you know, uh, the jurors have a right to use it or not use it. It's not, it's a charge that they're advised on, and the judge will say, you know, you, have a, you could use it, you don't, you don't have to use it. So you would think any, any open-minded individual would just not use it because it doesn't make sense, and you would revert back to the uh, instance and the example I, I cited earlier. I mean, then that would think you believe that if one cop does something wrong, all the superiors and all the higher ups then should be charged. And you know that's that's a uh, it's a dangerous line. It's a dangerous line to cross because those things cannot be foreseeable. A lot of these you you can't predict what somebody's going to do. You're not psychic. You can't predict these things. And they use that term, which I can't even believe that's used in a legal sense in any way, shape, or form, reasonably, reasonably foreseeable. It sounds like something that should be used at a carnival. When, some, you, know, when you walk over and uh, somebody's looking to guess your weight, I could reasonably foresee how, how much you're going to weigh or you know, uh, how tall you are or whatever it may be. It just doesn't sound like terminology that should be used in a legal sense. And that's really all I have to say on that, that topic. The other thing I wanted to to talk about and I just want you to think about it and again it's just something to to mow over something to analyze and something to keep in back of your head if and when the time comes that you ever are a juror and you are faced with that uh, charge you really have to think about that and you have to sometimes use your own personal convictions where if you don't believe in something and you have the option by the court not to use it don't use it Use what you're supposed to. Use the facts and, you, and use the evidence that were presented. Don't use this all-encompassing scapegoat of a charge to, uh, you know, to try and group in somebody who's completely innocent. And the other thing I was thinking about, which is very interesting, you know, uh, when you have informants, and I spoke about how I would love to do the statistics on it, where an informant is testifying in a case, and you'll get the prosecution or the state, you know, the government, where they'll give a speech on how, you know, they'll tell the juries, ladies and gentlemen, just because they're testifying today does not mean 
that they are going to get a lenient sentence. You know, we make no promises that their sentence is going to be a, a short one or is going to reflect any of their testimony that was given today or any of their cooperation. There, there, there's no guarantee that the judge will take that into consideration. And I had said I would love the statistics on that to present to juries which show each and every time an informant testified, the time that they were facing never equates to what they wound up receiving. There's always a huge benefit there. There's always a huge reduction. It's just the way it is. And if there's not, I'm sure those cases could be counted on one hand, and there's a reason behind it. Either the person was caught out and out lying by the government, or something had to happen. But overall, if you compare that, and I would present that if I was a defense attorney to the to the jurors before each informant got up on the stand, I would present to them, you know, and I would almost beat the government to the punch, and I would say, the government's going to get up here, and they're going to say that this informant is not guaranteed, that his sentence will be reduced, and then I would hit them with the stats, and I would say, well, 95% of the time they are reduced, and 95% of the time they get, uh, you know, one-tenth of what they're facing, or whatever the stats wind up coming in at. But we all know that an informant gets a huge benefit when it comes to time served. And, you know, one thing I always talk about, it. it's irrelevant what my personal verbiage is for informants or the way I look at them. Or, you know, if it goes against my moral code, my moral compass, and, and what I believe in, my whole thing is they should at least, at the very minimum, tell the truth. When they're lying, it's extremely dangerous. And they do a lot of damage to a lot of innocent people based on their lies. And there's no excuse for that. You know, that should be thoroughly vetted by the government. And when it's not, the government, they're all smart people. They're all very intelligent. So they're either just ignoring it or they just don't care if the person's lying because it goes back to the means justifies the ends. So one thing that I found interesting was when the informant pleas, you know, their plea is actually sealed for a while on the, uh, on the docket. So you can't even pull their plea. So if the case is, you know, if you're at the, you, you're waiting for sentencing and you want to see what these informants got, you can't even do that because they file it under seal, which means the public can't look at it. Now, from what I understand, after a long time goes by, you could then pull it. But what's ironic about that is every defendant, whoever pleads, whoever takes a plea, uh, when they're sentenced, that's all on the public docket. So you could see all the time everybody got. But conveniently, the informant's time is sealed. So if the defense wants to see their time, you know, say when they're working on the appeal, or the, it's all delayed. You got to wait for it to come out. You got to see, you know, maybe something, some of the minutes from the plea could help the appeal process. It's just another obstacle to get across. You know, it's just another tactic that's used to work against the defense and to work against getting a free trial. You know, what's good for the goose should always be good for the gander, and it doesn't work that way because it's just, uh, it just doesn't. You know, they, they're constantly shifting the odds in their favor. And that's not the way it's supposed to be when you're dealing with a fair trial, you know, and with a blind lady justice. But that's reality. That's how it is. And it's frustrating because if you're trying to build your case and you're trying to do your due diligence and you're trying to leave no stone unturned, and when you see all these sealed documents hitting the docket, you know, hitting the pacer, hitting the document, uh, the pacer is the... Uh, it's like the system uh, that they have in place where you could pull all the different cases, pull all the different uh, decisions, all of the sentencing, every, everything that takes place, it all hits this like database on PACER. And the database houses all the different information for the public to pull and, and read. You can read the judge's decisions. They can read motions. You know, and that's why I was actually so impressed with the article that investigative journalist um, Lisa Babic put out because all of that was pulled, you know, and that and that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of dedication. And to me, that just shows shows somebody's really going for the uh, truth. And in case you um, you missed it, if you go to ItalianInquisition.com, the article is up there, and also on the website GuiltForTheGuiltless.com, there's going to be an audio book coming out and an ebook. So you could, it's all going to be free. 
It's just to show the public what took place. And the audio, audio book I'm, I'm excited about because that, that's something that, you know, you could just download it and, and just listen to it when you have time. Sometimes, you know, people don't have time to read a, a large, intensive piece like that. So I believe a lot more, it's going to be available at the website directly, but it's also going to be on a lot of different, different sites as well. Uh, I believe it will be on SoundCloud. It will be on Audible.com. It's going to be on several sites where people could pull it right off. Same with the ebook, but the easiest way, and it will be promoted on social media. I'll make sure my firm puts it out there so everybody knows when it's released, and you could download both the ebook and the audio book. This way, you have it in both formats, and you could uh, read it and really understand what took place. And it will really open your eyes at how, when they want a target, they're going to get it, regardless, regardless of the methods used. Whatever they feel necessary, it's is going to happen. Um, I, I put up a uh, snippet of the audio book. I think the uh, gentleman uh, that we had uh, take on that project is doing a magnificent job. And again, it's a massive undertaking. And also, I want to thank uh, Rich from uh, Ruckus Radio. He was actually reading the article. And again, that's a, it's a big project. It's a massive undertaking. And uh, I mean, the more formats that place it, I know he's, I think he's on like part seven or episode six or seven. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very intensive article, but he's doing a great job as well. I mean, anybody who just reads it, just has people exposed to it, does a lot of good, just helps the general public understand what could take place. On a, on a side thought, um, I was actually watching um, that lowlife Jeffrey Epstein. They had a... Uh, a um, documentary on him on Netflix and I was watching it and I was just I was amazed because I think about defendants that I've come across defendants that my firm has worked you know uh, with under counsel and how this guy was treated in comparison and it's amazing uh, how different departments based on who you're dealing with they don't want to be bothered, you know, if, if they're not a target and they're not somebody that they want to go after. They overlook so many things. I mean, real quick, this private investigator was following Epstein around in Florida, I believe, and he was supposed to be, which I didn't know, I think back in 2000-something, this Epstein was arrested and he did, uh, he had house arrest. And he was either on house arrest or he was on home confinement, uh, he was serving the rest of his time. I don't remember, to be honest. But he had to be home is the point. He had to be in his, in his residence. And this PI went to Florida, and he actually saw him coming out of a hotel somewhere. And he went to the local police station, and he told them, you know, I have pictures of this guy coming out of the, the hotel. And they couldn't be bothered. You know, they, they told him, I think he quoted, he said, uh, you know how much money that guy has? And it's baffling because it goes to show the mindset of some of the individuals involved on the investigative side and on the prosecution side and on the law enforcement side, and they're just not there to do their job, you know. And I always said, all you want is somebody to do their job, just to do it fairly, no personal vendettas, just do the, your job. Go by the book, don't bend the rules, go by it. And it just had me thinking, I, I, I've read cases, recent cases too, where they followed a defendant. He took his daughter to, to the doctor, and they tried violating him. They actually took pictures of him supposedly looking at his phone, which he wasn't looking at his phone. He was looking at a magazine, but they tried saying it was his phone just to violate this somebody. Think about that. They, they went to this guy's doctor's appointment, not even for himself, for his daughter, and I talked about this previously, but it all tied in because here you have somebody who's out of state to go into a meeting and they were saying how this guy, this Epstein, was flying all over the place on his private jet. Never, never got violated. But here you got them going, and they're violating people for, uh, you know, going to doctor's visits, trying to make up charges of why they should be violated, that they were on the phone. And it's just, it's very frustrating because I don't know if the general public doesn't see these things, don't care, doesn't matter because it doesn't affect them. But it should because it's all about a fair system. And when you see that kind of hypocrisy... You really got to take a step back. And when you see a certain set of rules apply for a certain group of individuals that don't apply for another group, that's a problem. 
it just tells you right all it's not bs that it, you know that when we claim things aren't being done fairly it's not just somebody saying that this is legitimately going on endless examples could be cited and yet it doesn't make, raise that much of a ruckus you know it doesn't raise that much of a, of a big deal to people and it's extremely frustrating but those are all you know all things that the public should be aware of and they should just Again, try to look at it and say, well, how is this fair? Shouldn't it be the same way for all? If somebody violated their conditions, isn't that a violation across the board, regardless of their last name, regardless of who they are, regardless of the color of their skin, whatever the reason may be to discriminate and to prosecute and to target, whatever the reason may be, it shouldn't be. And if you hold a blind eye to it, you're just as, you, you know, you're part of it. You're, you're part of the problem. And if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that should all be issues that the American people should have a problem with. And that's it for today's episode. Just wanted to really touch on those two things. Again, um, I'm going to be having an episode with a couple return guests coming up. And that, that should be interesting. Uh, a couple of gentlemen who are big in the forensics. And they own forensic companies, uh, electronic forensic, audio forensic, anything to do with analysis and, and, and data. Uh, Patrick Eller and Andrew Garrett, they'll be on again. Right, so I'm looking forward to that uh, uh, that episode as well. And again, keep checking uh, guiltforthegiltless.com for updates and the release and also, uh, also our uh, social media. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope everybody's staying safe, and talk to you next time.